Good morning, Mike McCleary here from Marine Money and welcome back to the second part of our focus on the container sector. Uh, I feel like I would like to have the hot, hot, hot theme playing uh, in the background, but my tech, uh, my tech is not that advanced. I'd like to introduce our panel moderator, Jay Minspire. Jay's been researching and investing in maritime shipping for the past 10 years. He serves as head of research at Value Investors Edge, an exclusive research platform with approximately 500 members. His research is designed for active investors and traders of medium and high net worth, as well as for, as well as for family offices and hedge funds. Jay is also an active shipping voice on Seeking Alpha with over 15,000 followers, as well as on Twitter and other social media platforms. Jay, glad to have you with us and the panel is all yours. All right, excellent. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate that introduction and it's been great to be a friend of Marine Money over the years. I'm looking forward to getting back in person, but we have everyone here virtually and ready to get started. Uh, just as a reminder to folks, I do actively research and invest in the shipping companies, including the container ship sector. I have several container ship investments myself. Uh, so just so those disclosures are out there up front, I actually currently have a long position in both CPLP and GSL, uh, just so folks are aware of that. As we begin today, we have four excellent uh, folks here representing publicly traded shipping companies in the container ship sector. In alphabetical order of company, we have Jerry Calaviratos, the CEO of Capital Product Partners. We have uh, Simos Parayos, Chief Administrative Officer of Eurocees. We have Ian Weber, CEO of Global Shiplees. And we have Konstantin Bach, the CEO of MPC Container Ships, which trades on the Oslo Exchange. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jake. As we get started, before we dive into more of the specifics of the industry and into maybe some more company-specific capital allocation and strategy, I'd like to give you each about 30 seconds. Let's, let's keep it pretty brief, but just about 30 seconds to define your niche and your specific focus to the industry. So we'll start alphabetically. So uh, Jerry, you're up first. So what does CPLP do specifically? Uh, thank you, Jay. And uh, it's, uh, it's good to be here on the uh, marine money panel. Um, CPLP remains focused uh, on the post Panama sector. We have uh, 12 out of 15 container vessels, ranging from 5,000 BU wide beam um, containers uh, to 10,000 BU container vessels. We have recently acquired also Panama container vessels, uh, but we are overall more cautious um, in, in that segment. And uh, Simos, over to you to talk about Eurocees. Sure. Thanks for the introduction, Jay. Uh, Eurocees specializes in the sizes ranging uh, from, let's say, one to 6,000 EUs, uh, ships able to trade worldwide. Uh, the reason behind this uh, initially was that this size range uh, uh, <coughs> had more exposure to the market fluctuations uh, at the time. Uh, so it was more of a, of a shipping business like dry bakeries rather, rather than a financial deal that the bigger container ships uh, with longer term charters presented. Uh, um, however, over the, the last 10 years, we have, we have seen uh, a significant upsizing of the ships uh, of up to 7,000 EU, which now trade uh, more or less like ours. Uh, so we are also uh, considering uh, the upsizing of our fleet, but also in that in, the, in that size range, remaining in that size range. Something that we have done over the past uh, few years uh, uh, with the upgrade uh, and uh, upsize of, in, of our fleet. All right, thank you, Simos. Over to you, Ian. What is a Global Ship Lease specialty? Uh, thank, thanks, Jay. Good, good to be back at Marine Money, even though it's virtual. Um, we, we focus on mid-sized and smaller container ships. We have 49 on the water today. Um, we have announced the purchase of uh, a dozen um, uh, ships a couple of weeks ago, another four last week, which would take us up to 66 vessels, uh, some 345,000 TU, which puts us in the top 10 uh, container ship owners other than the liner companies. Um, although we focus on mid-size and smaller, the, the real size range we look at is sort of 2,200 up to about 10,000. Um, and we always look for an angle. We're buying 
um, mid-size, kind of mid-life ships uh, to, to maximize earnings for the rest of their useful lives. And they, we look to see vessels that are well-built, well-maintained, and have a degree of specialism like the four uh, 5,500 TU ships, the purchase of which we announced last week. They are ultra high reefer content. Uh, they've got 1,200 plugs, but they have installed power to carry more than 2,000 reefers, which puts them best in class, which is what we like to be. Thank you, Ian. Over to you, Constantine. What is MPC's focus? Sure, and uh, thanks, Jay, and thanks, uh, Mike and Matt, for having us here on Marine Money. Um, our focus is on vessels between one and 5,000 TU. We currently own 64 vessels. We have just announced yesterday evening a transaction that brings us to 75 vessels uh, by, by sometime in Q3 this year. Um, we focus on vessels that are deployed in intra-regional trades, um, um, and, and this is basically dominated by tonnage between one and 5,000 uh, TU. In fact, 98% of vessels trading in intra-regional trades are actually within that size bracket, so it's a very uh, clear focus. Um, uh, we believe the intra-regional uh, trades have the most compelling demand supply dynamics. Um, strongest demand growth over the last five years expected to be stronger than on the main hold trades uh, also going forward. Um, and on the supply side, uh, that segment is certainly well underbuilt compared to, to other sectors. So we believe also from that part, very interesting. And if you look at the age profile as well, there is a 40% of the fleet and that age bracket is about 15 years of age. So we believe that the demand supply dynamics are uh, particularly favorable for, for that size and segment and trades. Thank you, Constantine and gentlemen. We, we have a pretty good roundup then of, of what these four companies do and, and what their specialties are. We'll dive into a little bit of the macro of the container ship sector before we go into more of, of strategy and tactical allocations. Uh, folks who are listening live on the panel, please feel free to submit your questions and, and we'll try to get to them if we have time. I often see that some of the best questions always come from the listeners and, and the participants and not always from the moderator. So I'm aware of that and I'll do my best to, to circle those questions in. Uh, first question I have for you gentlemen, big picture. A lot of folks want to know what, what is driving the surge in container ship rates. Last year, the topics were, you know, it's COVID, it's a temporary dislocation, uh, but we've seen it's not temporary, right? We, we've seen it last now for about nine months of week on week on week increases. We've seen charter durations increase. Is this sustainable? And, and what else is driving this? We'll start with Ian Weber at, at Global Ship Lease. Ian, can you talk a little bit about the broad market? Um, sure. I mean, what, what, what's that? What's I'll hesitate to say what Clinton said, but it's all about supply and demand. Um, there's an excess of, uh, of demand for container ships over, over supply, as, as Constantine said, you know, mid-sized and smaller ships uh, are in short supply. The order book for them is um, pretty modest, uh, negligible, in fact, zero in some size, size categories. The idle fleet today is less than 1%, so effectively the, 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 feet, the fleet is, is, is fully employed. Um, uh, the carriers have been disciplined in, uh, in their deployment of, of, of tonnage. Uh, as we know, they took out a lot of big ships uh, the first half of last year uh, to support their own earnings power. Um, and and that, uh, that, that's kind of continued. Um, and demand has returned, demand growth has, has, has returned. And, and that's been, again, fueled by you know, COVID in the way where we're all sitting on money that we're not spending on holidays and experiences, but we're spending, spending that money on goods. And those goods have to come from uh, from somewhere else, uh, normally, uh, the, the further away, the better for the container shipping industry. Um, so I always buy my wine from Australia. Um, so, so that 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 that's it in in a nutshell. That there there is more demand for container ships um, than there is supply. Will it continue? We see we see no reason why not. Uh, the shipyards are full um, for for the next couple of years. If you if you wanted to order a container ship today, you wouldn't get it until 2023, 2024. Um, and, and by that time, um, we've got decarbonisation coming in, which is going to have a, 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 a constraining effect on effective supply. So, you know, we, we, don't, we don't see any reason why this shouldn't continue for the next several years. That yeah, certainly makes sense. Uh, I know over at Euroseas, they have several vessels, you have several vessels coming up for charter renewal this summer and, and this fall. So over to you, CMOS, what, what sort of durations are you seeing being offered by liners uh, and what can you hope to expect to get with your fleet? Well, in the current market, it's mostly what we want, not what the liners want. But uh, for the ships uh, up to, let's say, the old Panamax design, 
most deals now are between two to three years. And uh, for, for bigger vessels, this goes slightly longer. But uh, last week, I want to add that uh, I was surprised to see a few owners taking a, a very short duration uh, time, uh, time charters with uh, stratospheric level uh, rates. Uh, I mean, if there was a fixture of uh, two months uh, at $125,000 per day for uh, almost an old Panama ship, 90,000 for three months on a similar ship. We're hearing in the mid 60s now uh, rates uh, in the mid 60,000 for, uh, for benchmark Panamaxes, 50,000 for three years and uh, going down accordingly for, uh, sh for shorter periods. Uh, I, I, I think uh, this is a dynamic process. I mean, uh, one day, two years might make more sense. The next day, charters don't like that and they, they want a longer duration at a lower rate. So, this process is changing all the time. Right now, I would think that most, uh, every, most owners want to fix longer than two years in our size range. And uh, in, 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 the big, in, the biggest, in the bigger ships of this range, uh, this goes to, you know, at an average of three, maybe four years, uh, depending on the risk profile of each owner. Thanks, Simo. Certainly a, a quotable point there that it's what the owners want in this market, not what the liners want. I, I think that's a pretty clear takeaway. Um, MPC containers uh, just expanded their fleet with, with the Sangha takeover announced last night. Very large fleet in the feeder and midsize area. And almost every time I turn around and read a new broker report, I see a new fixture by MPC. So I know Constantine has his ear very close to the market. Uh, Constantine, a question I get a lot is, what's the sort of difference between a, a one-year, two-year, three-year charter? What sort of discounts are there? Uh, Simo started to hit on it a little bit, but can you add a little color to that? What, what is the sort of discount if you want to go long on duration? Sure. And, and I think what, what people need to understand when they look at these, these indices, they usually say one-year time charter index. And, and in reality, it's, most of the time it's not because the, the new normal is actually a, a two to three-year time charter. So, you, so you, would, you would basically get, a, as Simon has said, a, a significant premium if you get short. We, for example, have fixed just the other day a 2,800 TU vessel above $100,000 per day for 65 to 80 days. So, so this is a... Uh, I would say a new benchmark, um, and 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 this is, uh, however, um, a choice that we have taken because there was a a docking position, and we were able to benefit from that. Um, so so the vessel had to go only on a short charter. But that's if you have the right vessel in the right space, you can get astronomic rates on a short term. The new normal is two to three two to three years for vessels up to let's say five thousand. You're probably even more four years. Uh, so so two to four years, and this is the new normal. Uh, so you would you would actually see that as a new normal, and everything that goes shorter gets a premium. Um, and on certain occasions and instances, you can get a significant premium, as we have been able to secure. And that is an example. We bought that ship. It's a two eight. We bought her for for eight million, <laughs> and this charter alone pays eight million. So that gives you an idea of how dynamic and, um, and interesting the market is at the moment if you fetch the right deal on the chartering side. Certainly interesting. And, and it sounds like there's not a huge discount between the one year, two year, three year deals. And, and so it makes sense. Like I think Simos mentioned that, you know, going on longer term charters makes sense for, for, the, for the owner's perspective. Look, uh, investors look a lot at the Harper Peterson, the HarpX index. They also look at what's called the new context index to get their rates. Uh, both of those indices are usually based on one year charter durations. Um, however, I know you mentioned that, you know, two or three year deals are at that rate. Uh, do you think those indexes are accurately reflecting the, the one year market or are you suggesting those indexes are actually too low? Can you just quick follow up on that? I think the indices have difficulties in, in being up to date with reality. Uh, and, and this is not a fault by the people who, who derive the indices. I think it's just a matter of the, the, the very dynamic market uh, that we see at present. So um, um, I, I, I would say the, the index of last, uh, last week, basically on a one-year contract is the, the, the three-year contract uh, the, the following week. So it, it's really dynamic. It's difficult to, to get your head around. I think you should look at actual fixtures and not at indices. Um, and that's why I, I would say, you know, the indices are usually lagging behind both in terms of period and rate. And that's what makes it very difficult to nail down the exact market. We, for example, have fixed uh, uh, above 30 vessels this year already, and we have another 26 coming up. So 
I, I would argue we, we have a discussion always we have a discussion ongoing so I would say we know pretty well where the market stands um, and it is extremely dynamic um, over the last five weeks alone it, it has really skyrocketed on periods and on rates and there's no end in sight as Ian has said earlier as well it's uh, there's no reason to uh, to to be pessimistic for for the next couple of months and quarters in my view certainly makes sense. You know, in this market, there, there's two ways to profit. You can either roll your ship onto these larger and larger and longer and longer contracts, or you can harvest your assets and, and sell them. And I know I want to get Jerry into the conversation because CPLP made the decision to sell two of their 9,000 TEU vessels. And you also have a third one that comes up for renewal in 2022. So Jerry, can you talk a little bit about the trade-off there between uh, signing a long-term charter and potentially divesting? Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Jay. Um, as you say, it was um, uh, something that uh, we did not too long ago. Um, a couple of months ago, we opportunistically took an opportunity to sell two out of our three 9,000 new container vessels. Um, and uh, at the time, we achieved record high prices. Um, you know, the buyer wanted just one ship. Um, effectively, we sold. Uh, Two ships, um, um, even when the uh, the other ship had um, a below market char charter until um, later this year. Um, but you know, the immediate question when you sell a vessel, um, and especially in a market like this, is what do you do with the money compared to what you would have achieved in the charter market? Plus, of course, the residual value risk. Um, in our case, what we thought is that. Uh, Effectively, with the sale, we unlock approximately $100 million of equity between the two ships. Um, and it was clear to us that we can take part of this money, not even the whole amount of, of the equity, and invest it in brand new, larger, more energy efficient, and environmental friendly assets with um, hybrid scrubbers, uh, increased reefer capacity, uh, as well as 10 uh, year employment, uh, which generates more income. Um, so in a way, it was an arbitrage play um, between the sale and redeploying this, uh, this money. The, the unknown being, of course, uh, what happens um, in the charter market between um, the uh, delivery of the vessel and uh, to, to its new buyer and the delivery of, let's say, of uh, the new build, the replacement ship. Um, and in this respect, I tend to differ just a little bit uh, from um, um, the rest of the panel, it seems. I think short-term prospects, I fully agree. Um, container market is very strong. Um, we have been seeing charter market going from strength to, to, to strength. And, um, but the order book has been expanding. Um, the, I don't think necessarily 2022 uh, is at risk, uh, but uh, from 2023 onwards, uh, we have um, increased deliveries. In addition, uh, you know, the supply demand picture, it's not just uh, increased um, uh, demand um, um, and um, restricted supply because of the available fleet. I think a lot of the restriction uh, to the supply, the limited supply, let's say, comes uh, from uh, the impact of COVID. And really, uh, it has been like the game uh, whack-a-mole, right? I mean, you see COVID creating uh, congestion in the West Coast, and, and then that moves to Yan Kian, and now apparently also in Northern Europe and um, important terminals like Rotterdam. And it seems that this is going to continue. The question is, of course, uh, for, for how long, especially as vaccination um, uh, becomes more popular outside of the Western world. The other side is that uh, we have seen uh, the first signs of spending uh, going away from, uh, uh, let's say, consumption of containerized goods to services. The price of lumber is a good uh, indication. We have seen lumber prices uh, fall from very high uh, prices to still, on average, uh, um, very high levels, but it seems that increasingly less people are willing to spend on home improvement in the US uh, as long as they can get out there and drive and have barbecues. So I think we will see a more balanced demand and supply um, sometime in uh, 2022, and 2023 could, uh, could increasingly see more risk to the downside. 
So ripping record high profits from time to time and taking advantage of value arbitrages like the one I described early on, uh, or investing in other markets at the lower end of the cycle, I, it seems also sensible to me as a strategy. Excellent, thanks, thanks, uh, Jerry. And it's good always to have some balance on, on these debates. You know, some of the some of the panels can get kind of wildly bullish one way or the other, right? So it's good to have a little bit of debate and, and think about some of the forward risks. I, I want to turn to Ian at, at Global Ship Lease because you recently conducted two deals: one for twelve ships and one for an additional four ships. And, and these vessels are a lot older on average. Uh, I use middle age uh, on average. And, but they have fixed charters behind them. So can you talk a little bit about the economics of those deals and, and the rationale? Because it, it seems to be that your deal making is a little bit at odds perhaps with, with what Jerry talked about. Uh, sure, but just, just before I move on to that, a couple of observations on, on the supply side. Um, yeah, okay, that the order book does seem to be building for 2023 deliveries. Um, up until then, it's pretty modest. I think the forecasts of, of container fleet growth of 4% this year and 3% next year. Um, and and uh, you build for the, the lead leg. So, um, you know, that the, uh, and given the fleet is fully employed today, given container lines have had to speed their ships up, the reverse of slow steaming uh, to cope with the extra demand that there is, given the decarbonization EIX and all, all of the rest of it from 2023, which is gonna force a lot of ships to slow down to meet the emission requirements. We're, we're not complacent for one moment. This is a cyclical industry, but we're um, quietly confident for the next two or three years. Um, so uh, that, 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 that's just our, our view. Um, acquisitions, yes, we, we look to, increasingly we're looking to, uh, to, to assess a purchase over a relatively short period of time. It's got to earn its money um, over a, a five year time frame. say. Um, so, um, um, and we're you know, acutely aware of decarbonization. We don't want to build new ships, um, you know, yeah, apart from having to wait three years before you get any revenue. Uh, we, we think it's more appropriate to maximize the life of the existing fleet. And you know, we're not the only ship manager that can do it, but uh, we, we think we're pretty good at, at running old ships, which is why some of the liner companies are actually selling some of their older assets. Uh, into owners like us, um, because um, the, the line of companies aren't equipped to, to run the old ship. So we are increasingly looking at, at midlife and older, older tonnage uh, to, to maximize returns. And most, but not all, of, of our acquisitions are kind of sale and leaseback type transactions. Um, uh, so that, that we're, we're happy to receive a lower charter rate than market, but we pay a lower than market rate for the asset. That de-risks um, the, the transaction from our perspective and, uh, and, and maximizes our returns in, in, in our view. Every single transaction we do has to be accretive clearly. We don't chase deals because we want to own 100 ships. We chase deals because we think that they're, um, they're, they're good for shareholders. As, as my chairman, executive chairman said to, in a Trade Winds uh, article recently, um, uh, sorry, Marie Money to mention one of the competitors there, um, but we don't shoot every bird that passes uh, passes the window. We're very selective. We turn down down deals. Um, so that that's our philosophy, Jay. Midlife and smaller. Um, sorry, mid size and smaller. Midlife and potentially older. Maximize the use of existing assets. Uh, earn as much money as we can from these long term charters, um, so that we've got great forward cover to make our investors, uh, both uh, equity and credit, happy with our, our secure cash flows going out over three or five years. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, it sounds like you're, you're squeezing the juice out of the remaining assets and, and potentially having you know, optional upside if the market's strong in a few years. And if the market's not strong, then, then perhaps you, you divest at that point. Um, I, I want to turn to CMOS because we have one player, CPLP, which has divested some tonnage and is talking about modernization. We have MPC, which is doing a little bit of a roll-up strategy. We have GSL that's doing acquisitions. And, and we have Eurocis, your company, which is very steady and is just generating enormous free cash flow now, right? It was, you turned a corner. So now that you're generating free cash flow and your balance sheet is looking better and better, uh, what's your strategy? What, what sort of assets are you looking for? We will not uh, chase assets uh, at, this, uh, at this point of the market without uh, having significant time charter coverage that would uh, uh, 
uh, bring the residual risk of the ship down to median levels. Uh, but we're not also selling ships. We think uh, it's, a best, it's a very good period for owners to, to fix a time charter, a long time charter that essentially makes much more sense, sense than uh, selling the vessel at current prices. Uh, you can keep your vessel and uh, generate more or less the same uh, income as a sale would generate while maintaining the option, uh, uh, while maintaining the option of uh, a, a better market uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, however, having said that, I think that uh, for companies that are uh, fairly priced in the stock market, it is an excellent period to grow uh, using uh, its stock as currency uh, and, uh, and grow the company. Eurasis has done that over the, over the past uh, few years, since, especially since we became a pure play company after the spin off of the Dryberg fleet. Uh, <clears throat> most of our deals came through uh, ship for shares exchanges, but always uh, close uh, to our NAV. I mean, you have to be fairly priced to be able to use your stock as currency. I think this is the best strategy at the moment for uh, at least for our company. Thanks, Simos. Yeah, it's, it sounds like harvesting the assets you have and, and a potential roll up if you see one. Uh, speaking of roll ups, that's a good segue to Constantine and MPC, who, who just announced the, the Sanga deal uh, last night, kind of building uh, basically ships for share, uh, like you mentioned, Simos. Um, Constantine, one of the questions I get from a lot of investors, and I think it just popped up here in the, in the audience panel is you know folks are concerned that the rates are very strong and they're concerned that they're going to fall off a cliff you know maybe it's next month or maybe it's next week you know nobody really knows uh, what's your perspective on that do you, do you see what do you how do you see the rates going from here through like you know the middle of 2022 is, is there room for more strength or do you think we're getting out of toppy well that's a good question um the answer is i don't know but what i do know is that you know the market is so tight and then ian alluded to that earlier that there, there are there are almost no vessels available, right? You have a full utilization of the fleet. And, 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 and very importantly, and that is a difference to the last 12 years, especially in the smaller segments, vessels are on long-term charters. So, so they will not be available to the charter market within short, meaning uh, the market will dry out even further. So I'm, I'm, I'm still very positive on the, on, on the short-term market developments in terms of charter rights, and it might even go up. Um, that's... It, it will definitely not go down in my view in the next couple of months and, and quarters. So, so we are extremely positive definitely for the rest of 2021 and probably also for the first half of 2022. Uh, and that's also why we have probably taken a slightly different approach with, with the transaction that we have announced um, because we have not done sale and leasebacks or, or, or a, a transaction of that type. We intentionally bought into a fleet by using our currency. We believe this is a, a very accretive way of, of growth um, by bringing in an acquisition finance um, and uh, basically making use of the lack of asset prices versus charter rates. And that you cannot fetch in my view if you do a sale and lease back deal because it, it will be priced into the deal. Um, so you need to take uh, take some market risk. Um, we believe it's, it's market risk that one can take um, at least in the short run. A lot of these vessels will be uh, up for renewal in the next couple of uh, months uh, on the Songa fleet. So we believe this is a very attractive way to, to do an uh, accretive transaction and uh, basically arbitrating between the lagging behind of asset values and charter rates. One example, uh, 2,800 TU ship, um, you can probably, it's priced in the market, what, mid-20s mid maybe? 15 year old and you can charter those out um, almost up to $40,000 for three years at the moment. And that is a, a locked in EBITDA plus scrap that is significantly, I would say 60, 70% above that second hand price. So I think if you, I mean, it, you need to be comfortable with the risk and I'm not saying you should speculatively buy ships that come open in the market, but if you take a balanced approach on your portfolio um, and have a very low financial leverage, which is part of our DNA, um, then I think it's a very attractive, very accretive way to, to grow the platform, especially if you use your, your own stock, if you're well-priced compared to your, your um, NAV. And that's, that's probably a slightly different uh, flavor than, than some of the other transactions we have seen, uh, but that's what we deem an um, interesting path forward for us at least. Yeah, th thanks, Constantine. A very quick follow-up for you. How far in advance can you lock in those charters and fix those? Are we talking a few weeks, a few months? How, how far in advance can you move? Well, 
usually the smaller the ship, um, it depends with, with the existing charterer, you can obviously do whatever you want forward. Um, but then you have a bilateral discussion, usually probably don't get the best deal in a dynamic market. Um, but that can be done also on smaller vessels uh, a couple of a couple of months in advance. Um, usually, for vessels in our size, you would be looking at 30 to 60 days. Um, and that's in order to have a bit of competition in the process, um, that is probably um, the way to go. However, obviously, if, if our clients, our charters approach us to, to discuss a early renewal, we're obviously there to, to take that discussion and, and to consider that and potentially to, um, uh, to strike a deal um, also on a package fleet, which is what we have done as well, uh, to also address the needs of, of our clients, obviously the charters. Certainly makes sense. And, you know, Jerry, earlier you, you mentioned the concerns about upcoming environmental regulations and how those could play out. And we also had a great question in the chat about the 2023 EEXI standards. I know there's also been chatter about a potential bunker tonnage tax. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about that, Jerry? What, what impact do you think that's going to have on the container ship industry? Yeah, I think this uh, topic um, is uh, definitely one of uh, growing importance. Um, it's uh, almost unavoidable um, to, to discuss um, what um, will be the implications uh, of uh, ESG considerations and in particular the environmental footprint considerations. I, I think the recent change in the US administration has been a catalyst um, there is now ever increasing attention of international institutions to shipping. Um, and um, if, um, if anything, uh, I think this is only going to add to an increasingly heavy regulatory framework. Mm -hmm. um, the recent pronouncements of the IMO with regard to the reduction of the carbon intensity of the global fleet have been criticized. Many people have said this, is, this doesn't go far enough. Um, but um, I think if you see, even if you see these uh, new rules, um, EXI, carbon intensity um, uh, indicators um, and their annual reduction, I think they could have a material impact on the industry. Um, and uh, they will require owners with less efficient vessels to take on increasing capex uh, or adopt operational measures. Uh, slow steaming is one of those. But, um, you know, every year um, you have um, to continue to decrease uh, the, um, to show that you're decreasing your carbon intensity. So at some point, the question is uh, whether certain ships, especially the older ships, uh, will be um, operationally attractive uh, to, to charters if they just slow steam. Um, will they, there be a two-tier market? Will they have to resort to increased capex? Um, you know, there, there's compound modifications uh, to other energy saving devices or paints. I think there will be a wide um, range of measures that uh, less efficient vessels will have to take, both operational as well as, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, capex uh, to, uh, to tackle this uh, increasingly heavy uh, regulation. And that's before we take uh, into account any carbon tax, uh, which, uh, again, as in shipping, it's always owners tend to be the weakest link because of the fragmented nature of the industry. Um, and uh, then it's unclear who is going to, uh, uh, to take the burden. For me, uh, it should be the customer, the charterers, since uh, they are benefiting from uh, the um, trans transportation work that one does, but this is not uh, clear, and I think there are many discussions to be had. So our decision as CPLP is therefore to continue opportunistically, of course, uh, divest from older assets and focus more on modern assets, containers, as well as other types of ships, which have medium to long-term employment in place and um, will result uh, in a reduction of the car carbon intensity of the partnership as well as other greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we hope uh, over the coming quarters to also spell that out in a more concrete way. Um, and this is uh, the way that we have, uh, we think is the, the best way to, to navigate uh, the, uh, I think the avalanche of um, regulations in this uh, respect that we, we see coming uh, into the future. Thanks, Jerry. Yeah, certainly good to keep both eyes on that. Uh, Simos, over to you at, at Euroseas. You, you have a lot of uh, older tonnage, but it's very profitable in this market. 
how does the environmental regulation can, uh, risk factor, how does that uh, factor into decision-making at, at Euro Seas and how you place these vessels? Well, first of all, we, we, we're not seeing the environmental regulations as a threat to our fleet. Uh, I mean, we, we, we're, very, we're very comfortable on the technical side to operate those ships. Uh, we don't feel there is any risk on the technical side. The decision is purely economics. Uh, the environmental regulations that will kick in, uh, in, 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 a few, in a few months uh, will most likely be the sweet spot of the sector if, uh, if, the, if the market is uh, not as tight as it is now. Even if it's a fairly balanced market, those regulations could, uh, could uh, provide uh, a very good market for quite a few more years. I mean, uh, as uh, my colleague said earlier, the yards are fully booked uh, at least uh, uh, until uh, the end of 2023, and it's uh, even difficult to find slots in 2024, uh, depending on what we are looking for. So we don't we don't really see these environmental regulations as a threat. And uh, I mean, Eurosis has since its inception been uh, a, a, a company with a, a fleet uh, above the average age of the of our peers, but right now we're not we're not that far away. I mean, we have a 15 year old fleet. This is not uh, uh, such an old fleet, uh, uh, after all. I mean, uh, we 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 used to have a, an older fleet, but right now we feel that we're not something uh, above the average of our peers in this market. But as I said, the the decision is purely economic. It has nothing to do with. Uh, any operational or environmental risk and things, things like that. I mean, all these risks are priced when you buy a vessel. So we feel pretty comfortable uh, on, our, on, the, on the profile of our fleet. Yeah, and thanks. The, the regulations that you mentioned that uh, are expected, we see it as, a, as an asset rather than a, a worry for the, for the sector. Right. It makes it, it sounds like you, you've modeled out, you know, the lifetime of the, the asset and you've looked at the charters and, and you've decided that it, that it makes sense to move forward. If, Look, if, the market, if the market is uh, at levels uh, where uh, the ships are not making any money, yes, it would be a threat. But at the current market, uh, the liners are just looking for ships. If, uh, if there are less ships available, they will not ask uh, if it's an environmentally friendly vessel. They will just pay what vessel is worth at the time. And uh, it's probably gonna be even more profitable for us having those older ships. Yeah, percentage returns, of course, on older tonnage is, is usually higher. You just, you just gotta watch out for when the charter runs off. The state of the market at the time. I mean, right now, uh, we are very optimistic. We, we, we feel that uh, these regulations are what, what make people believe that the, this, this market will last longer. And uh, we're here to enjoy it. Thanks, Simos, and, and thanks, Jerry, as well, for your contributions earlier about, about some of the potential risk factors. You know, I, I think a lot of times when, when we're in the middle of a bullish, you know, heated market, uh, sometimes these panels get a little, you know, out of control, bullish. And, and I think today we've done a good job of, of keeping things level-headed and, and looking at both sides and, and talking about the risks. As we have a few minutes left, you know, I want to focus on a, a very important topic for investors in these companies, which is returns to these shareholders, specifically dividends. And that's a question I get almost daily. You know, when are we going to see more dividends? When are these coming? So I know uh, MPC has, has mentioned in the past that, that a dividend will be eventually forthcoming once you finish delivering. Uh, but you also announced that Songa deal uh, last night. Uh, how does that Songa deal play in? And can we still expect to see a dividend uh, late this year or early next year? Um, well, obviously, returning capital investor is, is is key. That's why that's why we operate, right? So um, we, however, see capital allocation as as something not static, but as something dynamic, um, and you need to factor in the environment in which you operate. And and uh, as I have explained, we announced uh, what I would see as a highly accretive deal um, to to the equity. We operate, um, um, we will benefit from this lagging behind of asset values and, and charter rates, and we will 
be in a position to, to generate significant cash flows. We have already locked in uh, more than 500 million in, in EBITDA, right, on, on, on our fleet, and we have more to come. So I, I think, you know, looking at then debt level of just above 300 million, uh, I mean, we, we, will, we can be debt free within a year. Um, on that basis. So, so that's probably the starting point in our considerations. And then we definitely believe operating with not a too high financial leverage is what you should do in a market of uncertainty as far as new regulation, as far as new investments are concerned. Um, and um, uh, that is key. So in our capital allocation principles, obviously looking at opportunities, um, looking at having the right leverage. And the next step in, in our um, kind of game is now post the, the Songa transaction to optimize our balance sheets to be positioned to allocate the capital prudently. And uh, returning capital investors is certainly very much up on the radar for that very exercise. But to optimize our balance sheet is certainly the, the first thing post the, the Songa deal. But we believe with that cash flow backlog and, and, and that capacity, that is something where we can position ourselves also towards a dividend in the not too distant future. And I have to, again, uh, tell you, Jay, that we, we want to wait for that to happen. Um, and whether that's end of this year or early next year, we will definitely within this year communicate our strategy uh, in, that, uh, in, in that respect. Um, and that's, that's where, where, where we're heading for in terms of our capital allocation principles. Thanks, Constantine. I appreciate that. Ian, uh, you announced a dividend uh, earlier this year, 12 cents after not being able to pay for five or six years, right? Because markets were tough. But then you doubled it almost instantly to 25 cents because the markets were getting even better. And then you've done two more deals. So is there room for potential upside on that 25 cent dividend now that you have even more assets? Yeah, you're muted, Ian. My apologies. Um, yeah, we did double the dividend from the 12 cents we indicated to 25. That's partly because one of the acquisitions came through earlier than we were expecting and the earnings started to flow. And you're right. And since then, we've announced the acquisition of another 16 ships. Um, and in theory, we have a higher dividend capacity. But um, listening to our, our, our shareholders, yeah, the majority, not all, I would have to acknowledge that, but the majority... I want to see us continue to grow on an accretive basis if, if we can find uh, appropriate acquisitions. And, and that's where we would allocate capital. But we, we, we keep this under review. It's, uh, it, it, it's constantly reviewed if we begin to see that we're running out of investment opportunities. Um, if we're comfortable with our level, level of leverage, um, then, uh, then the right thing to do would be to return more capital to, to investors. But for the moment, um, we're, we're looking to see if we can continue to grow the business as we have done so successfully over the last uh, couple of years. Jerry, over to you. you. You had a dividend cut last year when markets were uncertain, but now they're really strong. Is there a potential to bring that back? And Jerry, oh, we're Jay. on the clock, just so, just so you know, we have a, a, a good quick answer to that question would be great. <laughs> oh, okay, but very quick. We, we are paying a dividend. We haven't stopped paying a dividend for the last 14 years. We literally have paid hundreds of millions returning capital to unit holders. Um, and so and now we have a unit buyback program in place, uh, which should be quite accredited. So we are returning capital unit holders um, and uh, buying uh, units at discount to NAV. So, you know, our business model is a bit conservative, not very exciting, no, no spot exposure, but it works. Never had balance of issues and never stopped paying dividends. Thanks, Jerry. And uh, Michael, got you loud and clear. We're running out of time. I want to give CMOS a quick 10 seconds dividend. Do we have one from Eurosys? Uh, I want to remind our audience that Eurosys used to, uh, Eurosys used to be a dividend paying company in 2013. Uh, and uh, I can assure you that in our next board, this will be a topic to be decided. However, personally, I can share my opinion with you that uh, I think that uh, Constantine's approach uh, is, uh, is closer to what uh, our management feels here. I mean, we, we, we think that uh, the leveraging is a better option than uh, giving uh, back dividends, uh, at least for a company of our size. Uh, investors in today's shipping market, uh, equity investors, I don't really think that they are much interested in a, in a, in a, in a dividend. Uh, I mean, with the volatility in the markets uh, that high, I don't really see how an investor would care to get a three or five percent dividend when the volatility of the stock every day is uh, 
much more. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. See you all right. Thank you, everyone, gentlemen. And uh, Michael, thanks for keeping us on track. And uh, I always appreciate learning more about this market. <laughs> sure thing. Jay, thanks for your excellent leadership thanks. of that panel. Thanks to all the panelists for uh, your candid and informative uh, discussion. Uh, I would say for sure some of the challenges we discussed, like uh, the concern that rates are too high, are, are real things to think about and challenges, but you know, probably fall in the category of good problems or problems that we're happy to have after you know, the, the market the way they've been. So best success to everyone here. We'll keep uh, following you and, and thanks again. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Um, no reason to